Welcome to Bar 20 in this series on the Feasts and their Prophetic Message. Now what amazes me about this subject is that when I have finished an episode, I think, well, I've done now and there's nothing more to be said. And then it's amazing how the scripture just opens up and the subject keeps opening up. And so again, this week, I'm going to be talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. And there are further issues that we need to consider as the scripture opens this amazing subject to us. So may the Lord direct our thoughts and enrich us with his precious word. Now the great significance of the Feast of Tabernacles becomes obvious when we read the prophecy of Zechariah because during the millennium the nations will observe the Feast of Tabernacles every year for a thousand years. So obviously it is extremely important to the Lord. And so this is what we're told in Zechariah. Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the king. Remember the scripture says that all nations will come against Jerusalem. So the whole world gets involved in the anti-Semitism at the end. But they will now have to come before the Lord, the Lord Almighty, and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So the Feast of Tabernacles was therefore understood by the Jews of Jesus' day as a sign that his kingdom had been established. In other words, they believed that based upon Zechariah's prophecy, when Messiah comes, the nations will observe the Feast of Tabernacles. So that was well understood by the Jews of Jesus' day and by the disciples themselves. And this comes out in Matthew chapter 17, as we'll see. So this is the very famous moment when Jesus was transfigured before the disciples, an amazing experience for Peter, James and John. There Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. These three were so overwhelmed by the sight and the vision and what they saw and then Peter responded, as he so often did. Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, for modern readers, that seems like a very strange response. But Peter was responding because that vision, that revelation of Jesus shining like that, with Moses and Elijah either side of him, to Peter, that was the glorifying of Jesus, and he thought that the kingdom of God was now going to be established at that time. Therefore, it was time to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and build these shelters or booths for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. So that was his response, and that gives us an insight into what was in their mind. So, so as they anticipated the coming of the kingdom of the Lord upon the earth, they knew that the Feast of Tabernacles was one of the big issues. Now, much later on, in Peter's ministry, so Jesus had ascended, gone back to heaven. The disciples had received the Holy Spirit. They'd gone out into all the world preaching the gospel. And then Peter writes this letter. But in this letter, he recounts the experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. And this is what he says. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So that transfiguration experience to Peter was definitely a revelation of the second coming of Jesus. And that's why he thought the Feast of Tabernacles should immediately be celebrated. So let's have a quick reminder of the purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles. It is a thanksgiving for the harvest, the final harvest of the year. And as I've been saying in this episode, it prophetically speaks about the harvest of the nations all coming to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. It is a commemoration of the Israelites' time in the wilderness. Now, that is one of the great stories of the Old Testament. And it's something that the Lord doesn't want us to forget how that he 
supplied the needs of the Israelites for 40 years in the wilderness. He deprived them of water, of food, of everything in fact, and they lived in shelters, in tents, and he provided the food, he provided the water. They had to depend upon the Lord. And so this is a reminder of our dependence upon the Lord. Unique rituals during this festival of the tabernacles, such as water drawing ceremony from the pool of Siloam and the lighting of lamps are also part of this of the celebration. So the high priest would go draw water from the pool of Siloam and then pour it out before the people at on the last day of this Feast of Tabernacles and that was an important ritual. The festival is characterized by joy and festivity symbolizing both gratitude for agricultural bounty and God's provision for them in the historical journey of the Israelites through the wilderness. So the Lord, as I said, doesn't want us to forget that epic story of his provision and their dependency upon the Lord. We've got to remember that and the whole of the world needs to learn that we are dependent upon the Lord. I don't know if you find this, but in reading the Gospels and reading the things that Jesus said and the things that he did, sometimes they seem very strange, particularly to our modern way of thinking. But if we take a careful and a close look at what Jesus is saying and the things that he did and the timing of what he said, and we pay attention to this, it is really amazing and profound the depths of wisdom and glory that we can glean from the ministry of the Lord Jesus on earth. So as I've said many times before, nothing in scripture is incidental or random. It's all there for a purpose. And this is one of the occasions that I want to point out. So after this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works that you do. Now, it actually tells us that his brothers did not believe on him. So this was actually a bit of a mockery. But here's the important point. The Feast of Tabernacles was such a major occasion. All the leaders of the Jews would be in Jerusalem at that time and many others besides. So it was a huge gathering and it was a great opportunity to become famous, to do your thing in front of this huge crowd and become known. And so this is what the, the brothers were saying. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret, they said. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe on him, as I've said. So I believe the point that John is making by recording all of this is for us to understand that the Feast of Tabernacles is the ideal moment in Israel's calendar to be made known to the whole nation, to be glorified and to be known and seen by everybody. So that was the ideal time. And that was the point that the brothers were making. They were saying, Jesus, if you are that great and the things that you're doing, then go there and become famous. So it was almost a mockery, but it's giving us that important insight into how they viewed the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, it's important to note Jesus' response. He says, My time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testified that its works are evil. You go to the festival. In other words, he was not disagreeing with his brothers, but he was just saying, it's not the right time. I'm not going up to the festival because my time has not yet fully come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. So that's an important pointer for us to recognize that there will come a time when the Feast of Tabernacles is celebrated and it will be the time for Jesus to sit upon his throne as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and be glorified before not only all of Israel, but the whole world, every nation, as the kings come before him. So strangely, although he had said he was not going to go, and that was to make the point that I've just made, however, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the festival, 
the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, Where is he? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, He's a good man. Others replied, No, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. Even today, the same debate is going on. Some say Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that he's God in the flesh. Others say, no, he's a deceiver. Uh, he, he doesn't exist. We don't believe in him. And so there is this continual debate taking place. But at the Feast of Tabernacles, after the second coming of Jesus, when he is revealed as to who he is, the mighty King of Kings, everyone will know. Every eye will see him. And as the scripture says, and every knee shall bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having been taught? Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. So the way to know that Jesus is in fact the Son of God is to open our hearts to Him and let the Spirit of God reveal to us who Jesus Christ really is. But when Jesus returns and sits upon the throne, it will be a public revelation and demonstration to everyone. But now it's a case of the just shall live by faith. We need our spiritual eyes opened to know who Jesus is and believe upon him with all of our hearts. But the time is coming when he will be revealed to the whole world. That's why the last book in the Bible is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. So this is an aspect of the Feast of Tabernacles on the last day of the feast that I mentioned earlier on. In the time of Jesus, the climax of the Feast of Tabernacles comes on its closing day. The high priest brings a golden pitcher of water in procession from the Pool of Siloam and pours it out in front of the altar in the temple. And the whole reason for that is he asks God to give rain for the coming growing season and prays that he will pour out his spirit on his people. This now gives us an insight into the great significance of the Feast of Tabernacles that Jesus puts upon it, because at the time when the priest was pouring out water from the Pool of Siloam and praying, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, Rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So on the last day of this Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus then cries out, If anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink, and out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now what is interesting is he says, as the scripture has said. So what scripture could Jesus be referring to? It's very obvious that he was talking about the fact that we would receive the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. So let's grasp what the Lord is saying here. First of all, at the Feast of Tabernacles, as we've said, and as his brothers also indicated, the Feast of Tabernacles was a excellent time for Jesus to be revealed to the whole nation and then obviously to the whole world. But Jesus said, no, my time has not yet come. But what he is saying here is that for those who believe in me, out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And this he was talking about the Holy Spirit who is not yet given. So for those who believe in the Lord, he will be revealed. But the way he will be revealed is for us to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So as we go into the book of Acts, which I won't do now, we find that everyone that came to salvation, both Jew and Gentile, then later, as a second experience, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So this is a vital part of the message of 
the Feast of Tabernacles is we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to know who Jesus really is, but also so that rivers of living water may flow from us. In other words, the Holy Spirit will enable us to speak the words of life. Living water will come from each of us. We need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But which scripture was Jesus really thinking about when he says, as the scripture has said? So let's have a look at this. Remember the vision that Ezekiel was given. He says, the man, which of course was an angel, brought me back to the entrance to the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. And remember, he walked in that water and it was initially ankle deep and then it became knee deep. Then it became waist deep. So it was getting deeper and deeper and deeper. But this was a river flowing out of the temple. Just the very thing that Jesus was saying. But except that he said, out of our innermost being will flow these rivers of living water. So let's just keep this in mind. It's the temple and living water flowing from the temple. John in the book of Revelation speaks about the very same thing. He says, Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city, heavenly Jerusalem. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. So here is this river of life that John sees flowing from the very throne of God. So let's keep these things in mind as we grasp the depth of what Jesus is saying at the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. So let's also recall this very famous incident where the woman at the well came and met with Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks this water from the well will be thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So here is the very same principle that the living water Jesus will give to us. And we know from John 7 that he is talking about the Holy Spirit. Let's now add another piece to the puzzle. As believers gather together in the name of the Lord Jesus, this is what Paul tells us about us. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. So as Ezekiel sees the rivers of life, flowing out of the temple, which speaks of the ultimate temple, the throne of God, where the rivers of life will flow from the very throne of God. So likewise, in a microcosm, in a small sample, as believers get together, we represent the temple of the Lord, and out of our midst should flow rivers of living water. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God, we should be a source of life, a well of living water. And that's really our purpose as we gather together to encourage and inspire one another, edify one another, but also have the very words of life for those that are dying without a knowledge of the Lord. So the Lord in his grace and mercy has revealed himself to us and we then need to be an example and a light to those who don't know the Lord. But in another place, Paul tells us that not only are we collectively the temple of the Lord, but we each are individually the temple of the Lord. So let's consider that scripture as well. Jesus said, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So as Christians, we should never stagnate 
the Word of God should constantly be alive and fresh and new because the Holy Spirit is constantly showing us more and more of Jesus. As John wrote at the end of his Gospel, he said, If all the things that Jesus said and did were written in books, the world would not be able to contain them. And so there is so much more in Scripture. We should not just have a very narrow view, but let the Lord open our hearts and our minds to the whole of the Word of God and the whole of this mighty, glorious revelation of the Lord Jesus, so that out of us will flow rivers of living water, wisdom that comes from above, that touches the lives of the people around about us. And then ultimately, when Jesus has come and established his throne in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, then we are told God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. So Jesus will be revealed to the whole world as to who he is, his power, his wisdom, his glory. And they will gather to him and from him will flow rivers of living water. So let me conclude with this wonderful psalm, Psalm 2. Therefore you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and you and your ways will be destroyed. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. May God bless you and Maranatha.